In this video, we'll motivate generalized additive models by considering how we might perform non-parametric regression on several predictors. So in the previous lessons, we've just done one predictor, and now we're, we're trying to generalize a bit. So suppose that we have more than one predictor. Uh, a somewhat general form of the model might look like this. So we have our response is equal to some function of our predictors. And now it's not just a function of one predictor, but it's a function of many. And of course, it's a, uh, a function that takes in several variables, but uh, out gives an output of, of just one variable. And then plus an error term and you know making the standard assumptions on the error term like it's normally distributed for now with mean zero and some uh, constant variance for all i. So some examples of f might be the following. And some of these are pretty complicated, right? Uh, the first one takes in three different predictors and notice that there are some terms in the model like these that are just, um, you know, have individual predictors in them. But then there are other terms in the model that combine those predictors together. So there's something like an interaction between predictors and we'll want to differentiate between um, each of those in just a bit. But for now, I want to show that there's uh, some generality here. All right, we might have the second one, a function of two predictors, and it, you know, th there is no interaction term here, and same for the, for the third one, no interaction term. So this modeling setup allows us to be pretty general in that there are many predictors, and the relationships are clearly not linear. So some methods um, discussed in the previous videos could generalize. So for example, the kernel density estimator generalizes relatively nicely. I won't go through the details of this formula, but it, it should look very similar to the kernel density, uh, sorry, the, the kernel estimator of uh, the univariate case, except that we're replacing differences with uh, two norms in this case. But the problem with these generalizations is that because the fits can become very complex and high dimensions, visualization becomes very difficult or impossible. And remember that one of the things that we that we did when we looked at uh, kernel estimation in the univariate case was that we looked at plots and we visualized and tried to see, well, I don't think that fit is so great. Let me change, for example, the bandwidth lambda and, and see if I can get a better fit. So that sort of thing can become very difficult in high dimensions. You also would need a lot of data in very high dimensions and choosing your bandwidth in, in high dimensions can become very complicated. So it would be nice if we can perhaps make some simplifying assumptions that would allow for an, an easier process for fitting and then using these models. So here's one simplification. And I'll, I'll speak in terms of the expected value of y here so that we can just drop out the error terms, right? If the expected value of the error is zero of that epsilon term, then you know, we can speak about the expected value of y as just being f. And here, so I say the expected value of yi is now equal to the sum of some fits where these f's, f1 through fp, are some functions. Uh, they're arbitrary, but maybe, maybe we put some constraints on them like they're smooth. But now they are wrapped around just each individual predictor and we are adding up all of these f's and we might by convention just put the intercept term that beta naught term out front. So this formulation is called an additive model because the predictors enter the model in an additive way even though they're wrapped in some function that could be you know complicated and nonlinear. So the formulation is quite flexible it allows for a large class of models, but it does seriously restrict f from the more general formulation that we started with uh, on, the previous, on the previous slide. For example, the functions in 1 and 2 are no longer, 
we go back, uh, these functions, well actually it's just one, the, the function in one is no longer included in this setup because of that red dot term, right, the interaction term there. The other two do not have interaction terms and you know if we wanted to we can change them like multiply this last term by an x1 and then th this last term here would now become some you know f let's call it f2 of an x1 and an x2 and so that would break the form of the restriction that we just made right no longer do all of the predictors enter the model in an additive way these enter uh, in some more complicated way right in a multiplicative way here so although there are some restrictions on the class of functions now right that they need to be additive uh, the class is much more flexible than the standard you know normal linear model uh, even if we allow for polynomial terms and transformations in that paradigm uh, in large part it's much more flexible because we don't need to choose the transformation in advance right we toyed a little bit with normal linear models in choosing our transformations right having some polynomial term or maybe a square root transformation in a homework assignment and that's difficult because you need to know what the transformation is in advance but the, the nice thing about this setup is that we'll use non-parametric techniques from previous videos to learn the, uh, the fits of each of the individual uh, f functions here. A few things to note. Having an individual fj for each predictor xj might be overkill. And in particular, if we know that the relationship between the response and one of the the predictors xj is linear, then we could refrain from wrapping that predictor in a function to be estimated from the data, and we could allow it to enter linearly. So this formulation might look like the following, and the, the change here is that we have this term, and actually there, there should be a, a multiplication of a beta here, so there should be like a beta 1 out front. So here, this term is just uh, a linear term. We're saying that the first predictor enters linearly, and the other ones are potentially nonlinear, and we need to learn the relationships. And this is more efficient, right? We don't have to learn several parameters that are hidden in the Fs. We just have to learn the one, the beta one. And it also makes sense, it's more efficient if we know that the relationship is is linear so advantages are that we can account for categorical predictors or factors in this form so suppose that that x x1 is you know some factor like some uh some level of uh of a drug right some um you're doing an experiment and you're administering a drug and maybe you have a placebo and different uh, doses of the drug. Um, this x1 could be something like that, and it would enter linearly, and you wouldn't need to worry about learning some complicated f. So another advantage is that we can easily interpret the model parameter beta1 as we did for normal linear regression. So it's the mean response for a one unit increase in x1 adjusting for the other predictors. It's just now that the adjustments are nonlinear, but the additive nature of the model allows for this interpretation. So if we think the adjustments need to be nonlinear, then we might zero in on the thing that we care about, that x1, and interpret the coefficient related to x1 in that nice way. But now our adjustments are, are, um, are correct in that we think the relationships between those other predictors and the response are nonlinear. So one issue with additive models is that they will not work well when strong interaction terms between predictors exist. And in such cases we might consider adding interaction terms uh, like the following. So I have here in the last spot a function that 
takes in both x1 and x2 as uh, interacting with each other in some way. So there's nothing that says that you cannot do this in the additive model framework. It's just a matter of adding complication, right? You need more data to estimate a function like this, and you need to have some idea that there is some interaction in the model in order for you to add it. And then, of course, you can do some tests to decide whether to drop it, and those tests would be analogous to uh, tests that we've looked at for normal models. So another nice thing about the additive model framework is that it can be easily extended to non-normal responses in the way that we've seen for generalized linear models. So for example, if our response is Poisson, we might consider the following. So we would have our link function, in this case the log link for the Poisson regression model, and we would take the log of our mean and, and set it equal to perhaps something like this, uh, an intercept term beta naught plus a linear term beta one times x one plus some nonlinear terms, right? Some, some wiggly functions of the remainder of our predictors. So in this case, the log transformation of the mean of the Poisson lambda is a predictor that involves some linear terms, some nonlinear terms, but the entire predictor is additive. So let's consider an example just so that we can see um, what some of these relationships might look like. Consider the ozone data. It comes from a study of the relationship between atmospheric ozone concentration and meteorology in Los Angeles in uh, 1976. So researchers were interested in modeling ozone concentration, so that's the O3 variable, as a function of temperature, inversion base height, and inversion top temperature. And of course, the true analysis was more complicated, but we will look at the relationship between these four variables, so temperature, uh, IBH, and IBT as predictors, and O3 as the response. And here, you know, the thought is that the relationship is not just linear. So uh, a straight, you know, normal linear regression model would not be sufficient. It would not capture all of the variation in the data. And so here we might use an additive model where we learn some wiggly functions for some of these uh, predictors. So assuming the model is correct, the following plots would give us a sense of the marginal relationship between individual predictor variables, for example, temperature, and the response, O3. So we see that adjusting for the other predictors the ozone concentration is roughly linear up through about 60 degrees. So here the suggestion is, well, things look roughly linear in this region. And then at about 60 degrees, we seem to have some kind of change, right, to perhaps something else, some, some other line, right? Maybe that's another line in that region, but there's a change and the additive model seems to be capturing something about that change. Now for the IBT variable, we see the estimated fit includes some curvature, right? There's a little bit of curvature that we can see here. But the confidence bands, the dotted lines are the confidence bands, uh, the confidence bands for this fit would allow a line to pass through. So it seems pretty clear that we could you know, draw a straight line through with no curvature and still be well within the confidence bounds. And something like this might suggest that, well, we didn't really have to use such a complicated fit, right? We didn't have to wrap this IBT in a smooth function, and we could have just included it in our model in a linear way.
So in the next video, we'll look at a basic overview of some of the math of fitting generalized additive models, and then we'll see how to, um, to actually fit a generalized additive model in R and basically reconstruct these plots and understand a bit about things like goodness of fit, how to make predictions, uh, how to interpret these models, etc.